So for you with this 22-hour window of not eating, what do you think the benefits are other than your energy and slight spikes in norepinephrine and some other hormones? Well, I don't think there's sufficient evidence at this point in time that time-restricted feeding is going to impact my longevity. So I think that's the big claim. And it's the big claim what that's is being... The, what is the claim? Like, what are they saying? Oh, I mean, I think the claim would be that fasting mimicry, which could be, you know, like what, say, Walter Longo talks about where you do a five-day hypocaloric diet of 750 to 1,000 calories a day for five days, followed by 25 days of ad libitum feeding, meaning eat whatever the hell you want, um, uh, in terms of total caloric content. Um, you know, the claim is, well, that's going to enhance longevity. And, uh, or, you know, doing a 16-8 or 18-6 is going to enhance lifespan. So just to take a step back, um, I, I am only aware of... Uh, three things that have universally extended lifespan across all model organisms. So if you think of like all eukaryotes, right, if you go from yeast to worms to flies to mammals, the only things that uniformly extend life um, or almost uniformly is caloric restriction and or dietary restriction. So total reduction in calories during the lifetime and or reduction of certain subsets of those calories. So there's a super famous experiment that was done um, actually, if anyone's interested, I wrote about it. It's on my blog somewhere. But it's basically this, the best experiment ever done in caloric restriction was between monkeys. And there was a group at the NIH and a group at the University of Wisconsin. And it was like a 19-year experiment or something like that. So you could really study the impact of caloric restriction over these things. And that experiment showed us that caloric restriction extended lifespan if you had a really shitty diet. And it did not extend lifespan if you had a really good diet. Hmm. counterintuitive, but it also spoke to the idea that dietary restriction probably mattered. So in other words, if you're eating a regular diet of McDonald's every day, and then we put your counterpart eating 70% of McDonald's every day, that's going to move the needle. But in the Wisconsin, and uh, in, in the NIH experiment, when you took the monkeys that were eating kind of it wasn't their natural food, but it was less horrible food, the caloric restriction did not extend lifespan. So that threw a wrench in everyone's understanding of caloric restriction. And there are certain strains of mice that also don't seem to be enhanced in terms of lifespan, meaning just time on, on earth. Um, but for the most part, nutrient deprivation um, pretty ubiquitously extends life. The second thing that uniformly extends life across this is a drug called rapamycin, which is kind of like my favorite drug in the whole world. I mean, meaning it's like, I think it's the most important drug in, in terms of this space, not necessarily because it's a drug that we'll all be taking, though I do believe that is the case, but more importantly, because of what it's taught us about the nutrient sensing pathway and its target, which is this protein called TOR, the target of rapamycin, or mTOR, as you've probably heard of it, is mechanistic target of rapamycin. And rapamycin inhibits that. Now, it's a bit complicated because there's two variants of it. There's something called mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. And if you take rapamycin day in and day out every day, which, for example, transplant patients do, it's an immune suppressant. That doesn't seem to really extend lifespan. But if you take it in a pulsatile way, you selectively get this mTOR1 inhibition without the mTOR2 inhibition. That seems to produce longevity big time. And how does that work? How would you take it selectively? Well, um, this is sort of one of my main clinical interests uh, um, because I uh, obviously am waiting for the day when I can start taking it and ultimately, you know, feel that it's safe enough that I could give it to patients. Um, ex if I'm extrapolating from all of the best data out there, so that's looking at the work that's come out of a guy named David Sabatini's lab. David's uh, a guy at MIT. He's a professor. He's actually the guy that when he was a medical student, um, doing his PhD in 1994, actually discovered how rapamycin works in mammals. He's actually the guy that coined mechanistic target of rapamycin, mTORC, as a uh, name. And so now, whatever we are, almost 25 years later, um, you know, he's still running the powerhouse lab that understands it. So if you look at all of the literature that's coming out of their lab, coupled with a guy named Matt Caberlin at the University of Washington, who's doing rapamycin studies in dogs along with the work done by someone named Joan Manick, who was at the time at Novartis, is now at a company called Restore Bio, and a few other people. I, my intuition is that somewhere between two to six milligrams every five to seven days is probably the sweet spot. Um, but 
you know, am I confident enough in that to say that we should all be taking it? Not yet. There's a couple things that like I want to be able to measure before we do that. But, um, you know, in the animal data, this stuff's remarkable. If you look at Matt Caberlin's dog data, it's remarkable. Like what, what are they doing with it? Well, so for, so you, you own a dog, you know this, right? I mean, if you, if you look at outside of euthanasia or accidents, how do dogs die? They basically die of cancer and heart and, and, and they get dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's a different type of heart disease than humans get. They don't get atherosclerotic disease. They get heart failure. Their, their hearts just get too, too, too big and their rejection fraction, which is the amount of blood, the percentage of blood that leaves the ventricular chamber with every contraction. As that number goes down, bad things happen. Now, to put that in perspective, you and I sitting here, a couple of normal fit dudes, we probably have a resting ejection fraction of 60%. And if, like, we went out there and, like, killed it and worked out as hard as we could, at peak, we might get that up to 80 85% ejection fraction. So once the ejection fraction gets below 30%, you know, a person starts to become very symptomatic. Well... Matt took these dogs that had low ejection fractions to begin with, and I forget what the exact number was, but it might have been like below 40% or below 30%, put them on rapamycin for 12 weeks, and in just 12 weeks saw an absolute 10% improvement. So not didn't that means that's not going from 30 to 33. That's going from 30 to 40% EF improvement. Um, in other words, it's, it's hard to measure an effect in 12 weeks of a drug. Um, and certainly you're not going to be able to measure a longevity impact over that. So much of the study that's being done with this is looking at surrogate markers that we assume would portend longevity. So Matt's work focusing on um, the ejection fraction, uh, Manic's work was focused on immune response, which again was, so this was the turning point for me. This was like December of 2014 was like when everything in my professional world shifted in terms of my interest towards like rapamycin is the thing I want to know everything about because when I was a surgical resident, you know, we used to give rapamycin out like it was cotton candy to all the transplant patients. It was an amazing drug that revolutionized transplant physiology because it had far fewer side effects than massive doses of prednisone and things that we used to have to give patients. Now you could give them much less prednisone and you could give them rapamycin or cousins of rapamycin like FK506. And what you're doing with that stuff is you're suppressing the immune system so the body doesn't reject the organ? Exactly. Now when you do that, does that leave them susceptible to illness or disease? It does. It does. Yep. Would that be the case with rapamycin in person taking it for longevity? And that's the million dollar question. And so mm. I think in two... so. In a moment, I want, I'll, I'll tell you the story of how rapamycin came to be, because I think it's the most interesting story in biology, certainly in the last 25, 30 years. But when it was approved in 1999 by the FDA, it was for this indication. It was an immune suppressant. It was 10 years before anybody figured out that, oh, wait, this could also extend life. And therein you had this paradox, which was, wait a minute, how can an immune suppressant extend life? I mean, everybody acknowledges that immunity is a core you know, element of health. And so in December of 2014, I feel like it was like almost Christmas day. I remember thinking this is like the best present I've ever got. Um, Mannix Group published this paper, which they did in a group of about 320 uh, 65-year-olds-ish. So they put them into four groups. There's a placebo group, there was a group that got, and it wasn't actually rapamycin, it was everolimus, which is an analog of rapamycin. It's basically the same drug. So there was a group that got one milligram every single day, five milligrams once a week, 20 milligrams once a week. They did this for something like eight to 12 weeks, and then they washed out, meaning they got nothing for eight to 12 weeks, and then they were hit with a flu vaccine, and then the scientists measured the immune response, doing these really complicated assays where you look at T cell function. So relative to the placebo, paradoxically, all groups, and I say paradoxically because even the group that got one milligram once a day, all saw an increase in immunity, which is a good thing. But the five and 20 group saw an even bigger response. The people who just got five once a week or 20 once a week saw an even bigger response. But the group that took 20 once a week had more side effects. And the biggest side effect of rapamycin acutely is these awful, awful mouth sores called aphthous ulcers. Oof. They're nasty. They're brutal. 